Colossians chapter 3, verse 15. Found your place in your Bible. Stand with me, if you will, in honor of the reading of God's Word. The Bible says, Let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you are called in one body, and be thankful. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Lord, thank you for your blessed word, the inspired, infallible word of God. I pray in Jesus' name you speak into our heart tonight, and especially if someone's struggling about how to discern God's will, God's direction, God's purpose. I pray you use this message in their life. And thank you for the incredible truth of this small passage. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. The best I can remember, the first time I became really overwhelmed with the truth of this passage is when I was praying through whether I ought to become your pastor back in 1986. And this was one of the passages in the New Testament that it seems like the Lord drove me to. And it was then that I began to uh, write some messages out of my experience and what I'd learned there. Uh, how do I know if it's the will of God for me to do this? Are there any indicators, uh, things that I need to hear? How about the peace of God? You hear people all the time say, I believe this is what God would have me to do. I have peace about it. Well, let me pose a question. Is it possible to have false peace? And then how about the Word of God? Are we to search the Scriptures? Can God and will God like devotionally speak into our lives? I mean, is that why, what it's all about to get up early in the morning to get a word from the Lord and hope that God give direction and peace into your life? Can God, during those times when you're trying to decide, God, what would you have me to do? I want to do what Jesus would do and to know what he would do. Does he use the word of God? And then how, how does it matter that it really relates to his name? It, it, it has a natural division. Verse 15 talks about the peace of God. Verse 16 talks about the Word of God. And verse 17 talks about the name of God. Now, as a Christian, I want to be careful where I go. I want to be careful how I conduct myself because everything I do is related to the name of Jesus Christ. We wear his name. And so I want to be faithful with his name. And so basically, Jesus Christ is the believer's life. So in Colossians 3, really back even in verse 13, Paul outlines four motivations for godly living. And it's so evident that the centrality of this living is the Lord Jesus. He's the centerpiece of Christianity. Now, the Bible would teach us this in those few verses. It teaches us that we're to forgive because Christ forgave us in verse 13. We've not even looked at Colossians in our study these last four, few weeks. It is the peace of Christ that should rule in our hearts. It should be the determining factor in direction in my life. Verse 16, the Bible teaches that the Word of God should dwell in us richly or abundantly or it really translates extravagantly. We ought to have a good handle on the Word of God. People are always talking about how there's such biblical illiteracy and that ought not be true. Uh, you, that's why I really encourage people to be in small groups. Uh, one of the major challenges, I think, in our churches is to get people right related to one another in a local church, and I believe that happens in a small group setting in a Bible study. And then the name of Christ should be not only our identification relating everything to us, but the name of Christ is also our authority. We come in Jesus' name. And so Christ is all and in all. So the Scripture reminds us that since Christ is our life, we must uh, realize that all the resources needed for godly living are found in Christ. So it reminds us that we have the resources that are needed for godly living. However, we must be spiritually motivated in particular in four areas. Number one, I need to be motivated as a Christian to live for Jesus. I really do want to live my life for him. And what that means is I need to obey him. So as he speaks to me out of his word, uh, he will direct me, and as he does, I'm to obey him. And then I ought to live my life that it might honor him. I, I would really like for my life to honor Jesus. And then ultimately, for God to be glorified as a result of having lived his life in me. So because we've experienced the grace of God, we want to live for him. 
Because we've enjoyed the peace of God, we want to obey him. Because we have been enriched by the word of God and enabled by the name of God, we want to honor and glorify him. Now, this will all happen when several things take place. Let me just give you uh, two of the major thoughts from this text and talk about it. This will happen, first of all, when God's peace rules. Now, he talks about God's peace being the source of our peace. He talks about it being the spirit of our peace and it's also the subject of peace so let's look at the source of peace he says in verse number 15 let the peace of God rule in your hearts now positionally that's what God places in me I was at enmity with God there was a war between myself and my maker but the Bible says in Romans 5 1 therefore having been justified that is put in a right relationship with God by faith we have peace with God for our Lord Jesus Christ. Where I was at war with God, because of Jesus, I now am at peace with God. I love Billy Graham's little track. It's an extremely popular track. You've seen them through the years, simply entitled Peace with God. And what he talks about is how to have peace with God. Positionally, when I stand before God, I'm at peace with God. So the war between the unbeliever and God is over, and the treaty has been paid by Christ at the cross. That's what he's referring to in Ephesians 2.14 when he says, listen to this word, emphatically he says, he himself is our peace who has made both one, has broken down the middle wall of separation. He's talking about how he brings Jew and Gentiles together. He brings warring parties together and he does it through Jesus Christ. So emphatically emphasizes that Christ alone is the believer's source of peace. He himself is our peace peace that's positionally but how about the source of peace practically the peace of God one of my favorite verses in Isaiah Isaiah 26 3 says he will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon him or you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you Philippians 4 and verse 6 says be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. So it means that in the midst of circumstances which ordinarily cause anxiety, God's peace moves in, guards and protects the hearts and the minds of believers. In that sense, it surpasses all human understanding. Have you ever known anyone to go through something so difficult that you knew that there was just not going to be peace to meet their need. And then God, in surpassing ways, unexplainable ways, came in, guarded that person's heart and their mind, their emotions and their intellect, and gave them peace. So he promises this inner calmness of emotions and thoughts which rest on the assurance that God is too good to be unkind and too wise to be mistaken. So he's the source of peace. So when I need peace, where do I go? I go to the Lord Jesus Christ. But now I'm wanting and desiring the peace of God to rule. But then let me go a step further and talk to you for a moment about the spirit of peace. The Bible says about God's peace in verse 15, let the peace of God rule in your hearts to which also you were called into one body. This passage portrays God's peace in the unity of spirit. I want to say something to you. When the spirit of God is ruling and leading in a church, there will be unity in that church. I'm telling you when the Spirit of God is the source of peace in a family, that family will have peace. So it magnifies not only individual peace, but peace with others within the body. God calls us to unity and God calls us into harmony. Psalms 133 and verse 1 says, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. So God wants the church in unity. So he begins by saying this is the source of peace is Jesus Christ. The spirit of peace is that he's called us into one body. I mean, when he comes in, he makes a difference in our life. If peace is ruling in my heart, I become a very peaceful person. So he begins by talking about peace that rules within. He said, let the peace of God rule. 
That means to act as an umpire. It regulates all activities of the believer, overrules dissensions. Have you ever gone somewhere and you're a Christian and you got there and you begin to feel uncomfortable and you just begin to say, I, I just don't feel like this is right. I, I'm embarrassed to be here. I don't feel right. I'm going to get out of here and I don't plan to come back. I think what it is is a, a lack of peace. And what happened, God is ruling and overruling. He's regulating your activities and he overrules in the context of dissension. So whenever there is a conflict of motives or impulses or reasons, the peace of God must step in and decide which is to prevail. So there's the peace of God within. God's peace is regulating the activities of my life. He's the ruling factor in my life. And I've just heard people say, you know, I'm not here to condemn you, but I just have no peace that I'm to have anything to do with that. But he goes a step further. He also talks about the peace that rules without. Not just within. Rules in my life. But it says in one body, this calling by Jesus Christ is in the context of participation in and enjoyment of peace within his body, the church. Now, I mentioned to you a moment ago, is it possible to have a false peace? Well, let me just give you one story from the Bible and you tell me. There was a man named Jonah. I think you heard about him. And uh, Jonah received a call from God, and uh, you need to know enough about history to give him a little bit of a break. The place that God told him to go and preach to had been major invaders to his homeland. They were tremendous persecutors of his people. And so it may be, you know, God, I'm glad to go and preach, and if I'm not been personally affected, but those people, they don't deserve the gospel. And you, you need to know that when he did preach there, it was with the hopes that 40 days and Nineveh will be overturned, and it was almost like there was a snicker, 40, 39. I mean, he was waiting for it to happen. But long, long story short, when God told him to go, he didn't go. What did he do? He took a ship to Tarshish, remember? He went south. And by the way, anytime you disobey God, you always go down. You've heard all the sermons on Jonah. But he uh, deliberately disobeyed God. Yet, when he got on the boat, if you will follow him in the text, he is asleep in the bottom of the ship in a storm. Now, if you can sleep during a storm, you may say, that's peace. Not necessarily. I feel good about where I am. But then that storm got rougher. And then they begin to think, man, call on your gods. And he was a, with a bunch of pagans on the ship. And then the bottom line is they knew, God made it clear to them, that the reason they were experiencing that storm was because of somebody's disobedience. And disobedience normally does create storms. And so as a result of Jonah's decisions, others on the ship suffered great loss. And by the way, when you don't have God's peace ruling your own heart, others normally suffer as a result of your indecisiveness or your decisions that are not directed by God's peace. And if we're out of the will of God, we are certain to bring discord and disharmony to the ship or to the church. So Jonah thought he was at peace when actually his sin created the storm. 